Come vi dicevo, James Messerschmitt ha contribuito a costruire la ricerca teorica sulla costruzione sociale della mascolinità. Lo ha fatto proponendoci con Raylan Connell il concetto di mascolinità egemonica in una dimensione storica, plurale e conflittuale a proprio interno, quindi come dato non più eh, statico e inamovibile. Ma soprattutto poi successivamente ci ha proposto anche una rilettura di questo concetto con un, anche una rassegna molto ricca del dibattito che si è sviluppato attorno al concetto di mascolinità egemonica e con una proposta su ciò che sopravvive di questo concetto, di questa elaborazione e cosa va aggiornato, cosa ehm, in qualche modo mostra i propri limiti e cosa invece mostra la propria fertilità. Per questo siamo molto lieti che abbia accettato di introdurre il nostro workshop perché è la pietra su cui poi costruiremo un po' le nostre due giornate. Uh, um, yeah, I want to talk about uh, hegemonic masculinity and what I'd like to do is uh, go back in time a little bit at first uh, because uh, as all of you know uh, uh, that uh, concept as, uh, as Connell has recently uh, described it has a very strange career. Uh, those are actually Ray Wynn's, uh, Connell's uh, uh, words. And, uh, and I think that it's, uh, it's been uh, terribly misunderstood um, and uh, used in, uh, uh, in a very uh, inappropriate way. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, very important uh, because I think it's, it's uh, you know, the most important concept with regards to masculinities, that um, uh, everyone understand exactly uh, what the concept means and uh, my proposals for um, um, uh, making it uh, um, uh, work better for uh, understanding um, societies throughout the world and uh, um, helping us as activists to uh, challenge uh, that, uh, that construction. So uh, let me begin with uh, my dear friend, uh, Ray Wynn Connell. Um, Connell uh, uh, conceptualized uh, the notion of uh, multiple masculinities as uh, necessarily a part of uh, her formulation of hegemonic masculinity. Uh, Connell understood uh, hegemonic masculinity as one uh, specific form of masculinity in a given uh, historical and society-wide setting that legitimates unequal gender relations between men and women, masculinity and femininity, and among masculinities. Both the legitimation and relational features were central to her argument, and I can't emphasize that enough, because this is one area where most people have misunderstood the concept. Both the legitimation and the relational features were central to Connell's initial uh, argument and remain central, I believe, to the concept. Uh, because Connell emphasized that hegemonic masculinity must always be seen as constructed in relation to various non-hegemonic masculinities, as well as in relation to femininities. And the achievement of hegemonic masculinity occurs, according to Connell, largely through discursive legitimation or justification encouraging all to consent to, unite around, and embody such unequal gender relations. For Connell then, gender relations are structured through power inequalities between men and women, between masculinity and femininity, and among masculinities. And accordingly, the concept of emphasized femininity is therefore essential to uh, Connell's uh, early framework, underlining how this feminized form adopts, or excuse me, adapts to masculine power through compliance, nurturance, 
and empathy as womanly virtues. Connell argued that one hegemonic masculinity becomes ascendant society-wide and therefore is constructed in relation to what she identifies as four specific non-hegemonic masculinities. First, what Connell referred to as complicit masculinities do not actually embody hegemonic masculinity, yet through practice they realize some of the benefits of unequal gender relations. Second, Connell referred to subordinate, what she called subordinate masculinities, as constructed as lesser than or aberrant and deviant to hegemonic masculinities. Third, what uh, Connell uh, labeled marginalized masculinities are trivialized and or discriminated against because of unequal, because of other unequal uh, relations such as class relations, race relations, ethnicity relations, age relations, etc., etc. And finally, the fourth, non-hegemonic masculinity is what Connell referred to as protest masculinities, which uh, she argued are constructed as compensatory hyper-masculinities that are formed in reaction to social positions lacking economic and political power. Connell emphasized that hegemonic and non-hegemonic masculinities are all subject to change because they come into existence in specific settings and under particular social situations. And for hegemonic masculinity, there often exists a struggle for hegemony whereby older versions may be replaced by newer ones. The notion of hegemonic masculinity and non-hegemonic masculinities then opened up the possibility of change toward the abolition of gender inequalities and the creation of more egalitarian gender relations. Connell's initial uh, perspective found significant and enthusiastic, <coughs> excuse me, application from the 1980s to uh, the early 2000s, being utilized in a variety of academic disciplines and areas and as well by activists. <clears throat> Yet uh, despite this considerable favorable reception uh, of Connell's concepts, her perspective nevertheless attracted criticism that concentrated almost exclusively on the notion of hegemonic masculinity. For example, some scholars raised concerns regarding who actually represents hegemonic masculinity. Others argued that hegemonic masculinity simply reduces in practice to a reification of power and toxicity. And still others have suggested that the concept maintains an alleged unsatisfactory theory of the masculine subject. These criticisms resulted in new conceptualizations of the concept of hegemonic masculinity and new research on both hegemonic and non-hegemonic masculinities. So let me turn first to a brief discussion of some of that research on uh, uh, hegemonic uh, masculinity, some of the newer research. Uh, first of all, 12 years ago, Connell and I published um, a significant uh, reformulation of uh, the concept of hegemonic uh, masculinity. That reformulation uh, responded to the criticisms just mentioned as well as some other criticisms and went on to argue that instead of recognizing simply one 
hegemonic masculinity at only the society-wide level, Connell and I argued that scholars should analyze empirically existing hegemonic masculinities and non-hegemonic masculinities at at least three levels. There could be more levels, but at at least three levels. First, the local, what we call the local level, meaning constructed in arenas involving face-to-face -face interaction in uh, schools, for instance, organizations, uh, immediate uh, communities. Second, uh, what we labeled uh, regional, meaning constructed in the uh, global arenas of uh, transnational uh, world politics. <coughs> Excuse me. Meaning uh, constructed at the society-wide level. And third, the global, meaning constructed in the uh, global arenas of transnational world politics, business, and uh, uh, media. Uh, we also argued, Connell and I, that uh, with any level, there are often uh, conflicting hegemonic masculinities that, uh, that will be at play. And uh, links among the three levels uh, uh, exist. Uh, for instance, uh, global hegemonic masculinities pressure uh, regional and local hegemonic masculinities. And regional hegemonic masculinities provide cultural materials adopted or reworked in global arenas and uh, utilized in local uh, gender uh, dynamics. So in other words, we propose that there is an interaction between all of these three levels of hegemonic masculinities. Scholars uh, have subsequently uh, applied uh, this reformulated uh, concept of hegemonic masculinity by examining and uh, thereby uncovering uh, multiple hegemonic masculinities at the local, regional, and global levels. An excellent example of uh, one such hegemonic masculinity at the local level is uh, found in the work of uh, an American uh, sociologist by the name of Edward Morris, who studied uh, gender difference in academic perceptions and uh, outcomes at uh, a predominantly white and lower income rural high school in the state of Kentucky. Appropriating the concept of hegemonic masculinity as a specific contextual pattern of practice that discursively legitimates the subordination of women and femininity to men and masculinity Morris found that in school interaction positioned masculine qualities as superior to the, inf to the inferior qualities attached to femininity, as well as to certain forms of subordinate masculinity. This then provided uh, uh, an in-school justification for unequal uh, uh, gendered social action and therefore an example of a localized hegemonic masculinity. Two other uh, American uh, sociologists, uh, Ronald Weitzer and Charis Kubrin, demonstrated in their work how hegemonic masculinity can occur at the regional level. These authors appropriated the concept of hegemonic masculinity as the discursive subordination of women to men. They used the concept to examine all the rap albums that attained platinum status, which means uh, they had sales of at least one million copies or more, from 1992 to 2000. In other words, they, they examined the rap albums that achieved this platinum status from 1992 to 2000 and that therefore reached a large segment of the United States population, therefore justifying regional status. Weitzer's and Kubrin's study revealed how much this rap music constructed 
a regional form of hegemonic masculinity by depicting men and women as inherently different and unequal and by espousing a set of superior and inferior related gendered qualities for each, demonstrating how through this uh, uh, widespread distribution of rap music, gender inequality was legitimated at the regional level, thereby providing a society-wide cultural rationalization for unequal gender relations. Finally, at the global level, um, I don't know where this person comes from. Uh, I think she's also American. Sorry about the bias of the <laughs> research I'm going through, but uh, Elizabeth Hatfield is her name. Uh, she uh, examined uh, the popular uh, US-based television program, Two and a Half Men. <clears throat> and uh, Hatfield uh, uh, concentrated her scrutiny on the way uh, gender is constructed by the two main characters of that program, uh, Charlie and Alan, uh, who are white, uh, middle-class, uh, professional brothers uh, living together. During the 12 years that Two and a Half Men was broadcast, the program uh, was screened uh, worldwide in 24 uh, uh, different uh, countries, I imagine also Italy and Spain. Uh, and therefore, uh, this show had uh, both extensive regional and global uh, influence. Appropriating uh, hegemonic masculinity as a specific form of masculinity that subordinates femininity and alternative masculinities, Hatfield uh, found, not surprisingly, that Charlie constructed hegemonic masculinity and Alan employed a male femininity. And in the process, Alan's femininity consistently was subordinated to Charlie's hegemonic masculinity. This study is not, only important, is not only an important example of the global legitimation and rationalization of gender inequality discursively, right? It is also significant because it legitimates an unequal masculine-feminine relationship in and through two male bodies. But what else these, uh, these three studies that I just mentioned demonstrate is how differences among hegemonic masculinities occur in terms of significance, the significance and scope of their legitimating influence. The legitimating influence of localized hegemonic masculinities, such as the Morris study that I just briefly uh, uh, summarized, is limited to the confines of particular institutions, such as schools, whereas regional and global hegemonic masculinities, such as the Weitzer and Kubrin and the Hatfield study, studies, have respectively uh, society-wide and worldwide legitimating influence. Research has also examined how hegemonic masculinities are constructed in multiple ways. In my own work, my, my most recent work, I have uh, distinguished between dominating and protective forms of hegemonic masculinities and accordingly differing types of gendered power. For example, high school popular boys who verbalize, or excuse me, who verbal, verbally abuse and feminize other boys consolidate their localized hegemonic power through dominating aggressive bullying. In contrast, I unco uncovered distinct types of hegemonic math masculinities, both locally and globally, that were established through contest contrasting forms of benevolent protection. 
For example, in, in a public relationship, this was part of the research that I uncovered, in a, in a public relationship uh, between two individuals, one partner was found to be assertive and confident, while the other was found to be passive and shy. But the former is also, was also found to be compassionately protective. That is, that person emphasized caring, guidance, and support of the other partner. Therefore, this evidence challenges the notion that hegemonic masculinities are exclusively pernicious and noxious. These are, are a few, these, what I've just summarized, these are a few examples of differences among hegemonic masculinities. And arguably then, uh, unequal gender relations are le legitimated uh, in multiple ways. Also, uh, in uh, my most uh, uh, recent work, I've uh, found that uh, local, localized hegemonic masculinities uh, are, are fashioned uh, uh, usually through uh, relational material practices, relational material practices, such as the example I just gave of physical bullying, right? And they, therefore, through that uh, um, relational material practices, they, have a, they do have a discursive, legitimating influence within that localized arena. Whereas regional and global hegemonic masculinities tend to be constructed through discursive practices, such as Speeches, for instance, I've written a book on uh, the speeches of the two Bush uh, presidents. Um, it's called Hegemonic Masculinities and Camouflaged Politics. Um, but also, uh, you know, through rap albums, TV shows that I just mentioned, are discursive practices that concurrently constitute unequal gender relations linguistically, metaphorically, and therefore symbolically. So these are, uh, uh, you know, two different ways that hegemonic masculinities uh, can actually uh, uh, be fashioned and constructed. Uh, recent work on what has become known as hybrid masculinities reveals another layer to the idea of multiple hegemonic masculinities. Hybrid hegemonic masculinities involve the incorporation of subordinated styles and displays, either masculine or feminine, into uh, certain men's uh, identities, usually privileged men's identities, but not always, and in the process, uh, simultaneously securing and obscuring their hegemonic power. For instance, two other uh, American uh, sociologists, uh, Tristan Bridges and C.J. Pascal, uh, have recently shown that the appropriation of subordinated masculine practices into constructions of hegemonic masculinities <clears throat> excuse me, operate to reproduce unequal gender relations and thereby must be understood as expressions of, not challenges to, gender hegemony. Bridges and Pasco argue that hybrid hegemonic masculinities illustrate some of the changes that are currently taking place in reproducing gender hegemony. In particular, they demonstrate that experiencing and justifying privilege has transformed and new, what they call identity projects, new identity projects, are constructed that increase um, the, uh, the maximum 
excuse me, the, the masculine flexibility for, in particular, privileged uh, white men. And uh, I understand you had a speaker last year uh, who spoke on the metrosexual, which would be an example of that. And I don't know if he put it in the context of a hybrid masculinity, uh, but that's what Tristan Bridges and C.J. Pasco are referring to. And so Bridges and Pasco conclude that, uh, uh, that um, therefore, they uh, actually challenge any claim uh, such as that made by uh, Eric Anderson regarding, regarding so-called inclusive uh, masculinities, that uh, hegemonic masculinities are, are decreasing. In other words, they challenge uh, Mark McCormick, uh, Eric Anderson's, uh, you know, argument that uh, hegemonic masculinities are allegedly decreasing. They are not, according to uh, Bridges and Pasco and other scholars working in the tradition of, of, uh, of hybrid masculinities. Um, scholarship on hybrid uh, hegemonic masculinities has, uh, for the most part, concentrated on the global north. Yet uh, some masculinities, uh, or excuse me, such masculinities are likewise constructed in some parts of the global south. <clears throat> For instance, uh, Christian uh, Groves Green, um, a Danish uh, sociologist, I believe, uh, his uh, notion of phylogenist or phylogenous masculinities um, in uh, Mozambique uh, illustrates uh, this. Uh, Gross Green uh, discusses what he labels uh, the bompico, uh, meaning uh, uh, a good uh, lover. Uh, you know, a phylogenist is, uh, uh, according, you know, uh, to the dictionary, is a person who, uh, who likes or admires women. And so he uses this term to understand, for instance, a construction which he calls the bomb pico in Mozambique, meaning a good lover, a heterosexual form of masculinity which uh, prioritizes uh, women's uh, sexual pleasure and emphasizes uh, caring and attentiveness uh, toward women. However, what Gross Green else finds is that in prioritizing uh, women's uh, sexual pleasure, Bomb Pico uh, men in Mozambique reproduce hegemonic notions um, <coughs> of virility, potency, and strength and subordinate men who are seen as being sexually weak in other words, those who uh, are unable to uh, perform heterosexually. Men who practice uh, bon pico uh, masculinity then, uh, Gross Green argues, are aligning themselves with hegemonic masculinity even as their practices might seem to distance themselves from it. And therefore they reproduce uh, masculine power over women as well as over other, other men in a very novel way. And although not analyzing hybrid hegemonic masculinities, the South African sociologist Robert Morrell has, uh, for, for example, he's written a lot on hegemonic masculinity in South Africa, the, uh, uh, another part of the global south, uh, and in one of his writings, he's identified uh, three distinct uh, uh, localized hegemonic masculinities in that global South country. Um, um, uh, a white, first of all, a white hegemonic masculinity constructed by the uh, politically dominant uh, white ruling class. Second of all, an, uh, what he calls an African hegemonic masculinity fashioned by indigenous male chiefs. 
And uh, thirdly, a black hegemonic masculinity that existed in the various uh, South African uh, townships. So these uh, studies that I've gone through here with regards to hegemonic masculinities are only a few examples of research demonstrating multiple hegemonic masculinities and how they are accomplished differently throughout the world. What these scholars illustrate is that specific hierarchical gender relationships between men and women, uh, between masculinity and femininity, and among masculinities are legitimated, superbly capturing certain of the essential features of the omnipresent reproduction of unequal gender relations. Now, masculinity scholars have not simply examined multiple hegemonic masculinities. They have also researched the various forms of non-hegemonic masculinities, <coughs> excuse me, or those masculinities that do not legitimate gender inequality in particular social settings. That's why they're called non-hegemonic masculinities, because they do not legitimate gender inequality in and of themselves. So let me point out a few examples. Uh, close to uh, 20 years ago, uh, an American sociologist by the name of uh, Patricia Martin raised the issue of in inconsistent appropriations of Connell's original concept of hegemonic masculinity, insightfully observing that some scholars equated the concept with whatever type of masculinity that happened to be dominant at a particular time and place. And more recently, the Australian sociologist, Christine Beasley, labeled such inconsistent appropriation slippage, arguing that dominant forms of masculinity, such as those that are the, the most culturally celebrated in a particular setting, or the most common in a particular setting, <clears throat> may actually do little to legitimate men's power over women and femininities. Similarly, an American sociologist, Mimi Shippers, argued that it is essential to distinguish masculinities that legitimate men's power from those that do not. To elucidate uh, the significance and salience of hegemonic masculinities then, gender scholars must distinguish masculinities that legitimate gender inequality from those that do not. And some researchers have now begun to accomplish this. And I'll use myself as another example of this in my most recent work. Uh, for instance, I've uh, distinguished between uh, hegemonic and dominant forms of masculinities. Uh, following Connell, and what I've been, been doing in my most recent work is building on Connell's initial formulation, but still disagreeing with that initial formulation. Um, I define hegemonic masculinities as those masculinities that legitimate an unequal relationship locally, regionally, and globally between men and women, masculinity and femininity, and among masculinities. In contrast, dominant masculinities are not always associated with and linked to gender hegemony, but refer to, once again, locally, regionally, and globally following Christine Beasley's argument, the most celebrated common or current form of masculinity in a particular social setting. As an example of dominant masculinities, <clears throat> I uh, interviewed uh, teenage boys who uh, uniformly identified certain boys in school who were structurally dominant in their particular school. In other words, they were the popular boys. They were often the uh, tough and athletic uh, boys. 
They were the boys who attended all the parties. They were uh, the boys who uh, allegedly participated in heterosexuality. They spoke about engaging in heterosexuality, right? And uh, they were the boys who had lots of friends. In other words, these dominant boys represented the most celebrated form of masculinity in the clique structure within schools, yet they did not, in and of themselves, legitimate an unequal gender relationship. So they were dominant, they represented a dominant masculinity in that localized setting, but not a hegemonic masculinity. And the mistake that many people have made is what Christine Beasley called slippage, right? Slipping from that understanding of hegemonic masculinity in terms of a relationship, right? A relationship between femininity and masculinity that is unequal. Slipping from that to identifying dominant forms of masculinity as allegedly hegemonic masculinity. That's not what Connell meant in her original formulation, and it's not what I mean either in my current uh, research. So research on dominant masculinities is significant because it enables, I believe, a more distinct conceptualization <clears throat> of how hegemonic masculinities are unique and indeed complex among the multiplicity of masculinities and making a clear distinction between hegemonic and dominant masculinities will enable scholars to recognize and research various non-hegemonic masculinities, yet they are still powerful masculinities, and how they differ from hegemonic masculinities as well as how they differ among themselves. A number of scholars have also uncovered what may be labeled mundane, run-of-the-mill, personalized and positive forms of masculinities that are constructed outside the realm of hegemonic and or dominant masculine relations and often contribute to uh, legitimating egalitarian gender relations. For example, uh, an English uh, um, I think he's a sociologist, I'm not positive. His name is John Swain. He may be uh, in, the, in an education department uh, rather than a sociologist. Uh, but John Swain uh, did a study of uh, 10 and 11 year old boys in three schools in the, in the UK. And uh, uh, Swain uh, uh, builds on Connell's scheme of uh, multiple masculinities by showing that although some boys uh, clearly are hegemonic, some boys are complicit, and some boys are subordinated, Swain also found that certain boys construct what he called personalized masculinities that transcend uh, the available masculinities in the sphere of hegemonic relations at the three schools. In, in other words, he found these personalized masculinities in all three schools that he studied. These boys, uh, uh, Swain found, have no desire to practice uh, in school uh, uh, hegemonic or dominant uh, masculinities. And they are not uh, subordinated, nor do they subordinate others, either boys or girls. In fact, uh, their masculinities are rather positive in the sense of being practiced in small groups of boys with similar interests such as computers, theater, band, you know, etc. They are uh, uh, inclusive and egalitarian and they are non-hierarchical without any clearly identified leader. Similarly, I have found in my most uh, recent research 
such uh, personalized and positive uh, uh, non-hegemonic masculinities by uh, a certain uh, teenage boys that I've interviewed who have uh, frequently reported to me, for example, hanging out in what they referred to as the unpopular groups at school that uh, usually included both boys and girls in those groups who were uh, nonviolent. They did not uh, uh, emphasize uh, heterosexuality and accepted uh, celibacy. Uh, the boys uh, were not misogynist. Uh, they uh, embraced uh, diversity in bodies and sexualities. They were non-hierarchical and they had no desire to be popular. Indeed, uh, members of uh, these uh, kinds of groups viewed themselves as different from rather than inferior to the dominant boys and girls. Consequently, such positive masculinities were not constructed in a structural relationship <clears throat> of gender and sexual inequality. They did not legitimate unequal gender and sexual relations, and they were practiced in settings situated outside stable, unequal gender relations. Another example of personalized and positive uh, non-hegemonic masculinities was recently detailed by the American sociologist Michael Mesner and, uh, and his colleagues. Ex Examining uh, certain men's engagements with progressive gender politics from the 1970s to the present, um, particularly efforts by these men to stop sexual and domestic violence against women, uh, Mesner and his colleagues' uh, analysis demonstrates how time periods shaped their strategy to combat this type of violence. Uh, for men who engaged in this activist work in the 1970s and 1980s, for example, they were found to be disproportionately white, oftentimes Jewish, college educated, and attracted to anti-rape and anti-domestic violence work by their immersion in feminist and other radical social movements of the era. For those men drawn to this type of anti-violence work today, though, Mesner and his colleagues found differences based on race and class. White, middle-class men commonly begin uh, uh, through university-based activism, women's uh, studies uh, courses, and volunteer or paid work in feminist community nonprofits. <coughs> Whereas uh, working class men of color in the U.S. attempt to prevent violence against women by working with boys and young men in poor communities around youth gang violence, substance abuse programs, and prison reform. Either way, the research by Mesner and colleagues is valuable in the sense of recognizing and pinpointing certain positive masculinities, and therefore gender practices that challenge gender hegemony and have crucial uh, implications for social policy. Personalized and positive masculinities are also constructed, I've found, in the global south. For instance, um, Chad Broughton, um, examined uh, how uh, neoliberal globalization in Mexico created a novel northward mass departure from uh, the Mexican southern states by working class men. In particular, Broughton analyzed how economically dis dislocated southern Mexican men, mainly because of the North American Free Trade Agreement, negotiated hegemonic masculinity while confronting extraordinary pressure to migrate to the United States. 
Broughton found that these men constructed three differing masculinities in reaction to migration pressures in neoliberal Mexico. <clears throat> the first was what Broughton labeled the traditionalist, who emphasized maintaining the established local hegemonic masculinity, primarily through family cohesion, and therefore did not migrate. The second was what Broughton labeled the breadwinner, who did migrate to the United States to hopefully find work and adequately uh, uh, provide uh, for his wife and children. However, for the third, uh, Broughton found what he labeled the adventurer, the northern uh, uh, border and beyond offered a place to earn uh, considerable money for the adventurer and to pr prove his masculinity in new ways, Broughton found. For example, uh, such as uh, you know, thrill-seeking and breaking free from the inflexibility of rural life. Rejecting the localized notion of uh, hegemonic masculinity um, migration to the north presented a progressive kind of uh, avant-garde means to survive economic disorder by upgrading one's masculine status and assessing the adventurer's bravery. So one of the most uh, important aspects of this article is its, Broughton's article is its demonstration of how Specific forms of complicity with hegemonic masculinity, such as the traditionalist and the breadwinner, and a personalized resistance to hegemonic masculinity, such as the adventurer, were constructed under identical neoliberal uh, conditions, is what Broughton found. Now, research has also demonstrated that masculinity is not determined biologically and therefore not exclusively coupled with people assigned male at birth. Almost 20 years ago, Jack Halberstam examined uh, the diversity of gender expressions among masculine women, uncovering a hidden history of what Halberstam called female masculinities. This work led some uh, masculinity scholars to identify and examine masculinities constructed by those assigned female at birth. For example, uh, an American sociologist, Jody Miller, shows in her important book, One of the Guys, that certain uh, gang girls, this is a study of girls in gangs in the US, um, that certain uh, gang girls identify with the boys in their gangs and describe such gangs as masculinist enterprises. <clears throat> these gangs differentiate themselves, excuse me, these girls differentiate themselves from, uh, from other gang girls by engaging in gender crossing and embracing a masculine identity that they view as contradicting their bodily sex category, which they see as female. Uh, similarly, my uh, uh, life history uh, study of uh, adolescent uh, assaultive violence um, reported uh, in my 2012 book called uh, Gender, uh, Heterosexuality, and Youth Violence, I discovered uh, numerous uh, gender constructions by violent girls and found that some girls do masculinity by in part displaying themselves in a masculine way by engaging primarily in what they and others in their milieu consider to be authentically masculine behavior, and by rejecting outright most aspects of femininity. <clears throat> Arguably then, girls and women who practice masculinity 
disrupt gender difference and inequality. The notion of female masculinities provides evidence of the complicated and diverse nature of uh, sex gender embodiment and moves us beyond, I believe, the masculine-feminine dichotomy toward the recognition of alternative uh, uh, gender dimensions. Uh, such masculinities disturb the view of solely two oppositional gender categories and challenge, challenges perspectives that conflate sex with gender. Now, earlier I provided examples of masculinities, both hegemonic and non-hegemonic, in the global south. <clears throat> but academic work on masculinities since at least the 1950s has demonstrated a unique relationship among globalization, colonialism, and uh, masculinity. By the early 2000s, research and theoretical development on globalization and masculinities was greatly diversified to include, for example, studies on uh, Japan, Australia, Latin America, uh, the Middle East, uh, China, etc., 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 right? And Connell uh, recently outlined a strategy for conceptualizing global masculinities based on north-south relations. In examining masculinity scholarship in both the global north and the global south, Connell notes how scholars in the, la in the latter often rely on theories and research developed in the former because of what she calls the structure of knowledge production in the global economy of knowledge, which has made it difficult to fully comprehend masculinities constructed in the global south. Connell examines masculinities from around uh, the global south, and in doing so, she provides a foundation for understanding the relationship among masculinity uh, constructions in both the North and the South. Uh, Connell demonstrates that uh, the global form formation of multiple masculinities must be conceptualized through an understanding of, for, for instance, colonial conquest and social disruption, the building of colonial societies and the global capitalist economy, and post-independent globalization. In other words, these features are unique, Connell argues, and I think correctly, to understanding the unique construction of masculinities in the global south. In various uh, recent publications, uh, Jeff Hearn, <coughs> who was also here last year, right? I understand, and uh, his uh, colleagues, have uh, likewise uh, noted that uh, most studies of men and masculinities have uh, concentrated their uh, research efforts within the boundaries of individual national contexts, leaving unexamined the multiple masculinities in terms of globalization and transnational situations. For Hearn and his colleagues, some contemporary arenas involving transnational gender inequalities <clears throat> and therefore transnational multiple masculinities include transnational corporations and government organizations with men in almost exclusive positions of power, international trade, global finance, and the mas masculinization of capital, militarism and the arms trade, international sports, migrations and refugees, information and communication technologies, and the sex trade, just to mention a few. Right. So in conclusion then, 
The empirical uh, evidence indicates first that we must move beyond the notion of one society-wide hegemonic masculinity and recognize the existence of multiple hegemonic masculinities at the local, regional, and global levels. <clears throat> Although identifying a single ascendant hegemonic masculinity at each level may someday be possible, no one to date has successfully done so. This is probably the case because it is extremely difficult to measure such ascendancy and thereby determine which particular masculinity among the whole variety in the offering at each level is indeed the ascendant hegemonic masculinity at any of the three levels, right? Until a method is devised for determining exactly which masculinity is the hegemonic ascendant at each level, <clears throat> we must speak of hegemonic masculinity wholly in plural terms, analyzing hegemonic masculinities at the local, regional, and global levels. Additionally, Scholars must continue to build on and indeed expand Connell's original idea of multiple non-hegemonic masculinities. Although research continues to uncover complicit, subordinate, and protest masculinities, studies have also revealed multiple additional non-hegemonic masculinities as I've outlined. And in particular, some of these non-hegemonic masculinities, I believe, move us in the direction of identifying possible domains for social change. I'm, of course, specifically pointing to personalized and positive masculinities, as well as so-called female masculinities, because they are significant for their oppositional qualities and value. Thank you very much for being very nice listeners. <laughs> so I'll be glad to answer any questions that you ha might have. I hope I didn't depress anyone. Um, it, uh, I think uh, what this evidence reveals is if we're interested in social change, we have a lot of work ahead of us, yeah. right? A lot of work ahead of us. Yeah. One thing is, um, first of all, you talked about the different levels, uh, which I think is, is extremely important. So the local, regional, and global. Um, um, and I think when you talked about the local, you, talk, you, you, you thought more about the, the, the material practices. Um, then, uh, and then yep. when you s focus on the regional and global, you, you, you were thinking more of the discursive right. um, dimension. Um, so my question would be, uh, is there not a material dimension to the, lo to the global and the regional when we do that kind of there analysis? There is. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe if you can spend a few yeah. words on that. And the second point would okay. be uh, around the personalized positive masculinity that you refer to. Can I to? Ask, answer the first two oh, yeah, yeah. so that I don't forget it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, in fact, uh, Connell, uh, uh, in her work on what she called trans, transnational uh, global uh, hegemonic masculinity, um, was uh, uh, clearly based on material practices. Um, there's an Australian um, sociologist who works with Christine Beasley, um, and, I, and her, her name escapes me right now, but she's done some really good work on uh, global uh, hegemonic masculinities in uh, corporations as well. And um, um, yeah, so uh, uh, it's, yeah, I, th I think both happen uh, at, at each level, you know, discursive can happen at, at the local level as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It was a matter of emphasis. Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that, uh, you know, in yeah. the particular examples that I gave, yeah. that, uh, um, you know, that they were, you know, examples of, of these two distinct forms yeah. of, uh, which I don't think have been, has been recognized before. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the concentration has been on material practices. And not that, um, 
you know, unequal gender relations can be uh, symbolized ling linguistically and uh, discursively, right? The, the, the second point will be around uh, so the, the positive, um, personalized, non-hegemonic masculinities. Um, so in that case, you uh, um, um, treated as, uh, that, 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 that space as an object. So masculinity becomes an object somehow. Because I'm thinking that there is also a process around. You know, so if masculinity is uh, it's a terrain upon which we, uh, you know, we can express and act as a particular subject position. And then it's something that is available uh, to you at some point. So a positive personalized masculinity somehow could become a, a, a sort of a hegemonic, a, or it could, could, could masculinity perhaps. You know, so so it's something that Hege can be hegemonic in the sense of uh, legitimizing a legitimizing equal, gender inequality, egalitarian as, 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 relations. Exactly. Yeah. So, so in a way, it's. Uh, <coughs> How do we neatly separate those? Um, and I think that is my problem with with that kind of systematization. Sometimes, you know, where because if we think of masculinity as processes, then it's very difficult to do um, that kind of work. Yeah, I'm not sure I completely understand your question. Yeah. How how do we separate what? How do we separate the uh, the personalized positive masculinity from from a, a form of hegemonic masculinity. Oh, e oh, if, okay. if hegemonic is, if we, if we think of it as processes yeah. rather than uh, than yeah, objects. Yeah, it's it's based on the relationship, the relationship that that is is existing in the situation where those masculinities are constructed. So, for instance, uh, you know the the positive masculinities that I found. You know, were uh, uh, teenage boys who, uh, you know, I, I remember this one boy I interviewed by the name of Jerry, who um, uh, was a nonviolent boy, and uh, uh, he hung out in what he called the laid-back crowd, and that laid-back crowd was was uh, egalitarian in terms of uh, of relationships. In, in other words, there were both boys and girls in the laid-back crowd. They were non-hierarchical. <clears throat> the, the boys in that group were, were not misogynistic. They were not homophobic. Uh, you know, all kinds of bodies participated. You know, I mean, it was, it was very inclusive. Not in the sense of Eric Anderson, but in, in the sense of I inclusivity overall, right? And so you have a different you have a different kind of relationship there than you do in a hegemonic masculine relationship. For instance, I gave the example of a bullying relationship, and this is this is also something that I've uncovered that I didn't mention in my talk, and I'm glad you raised this because hegemonic masculinity can also be very momentary and fleeting. You know. I mean, it, it can be created very quickly and then dissolve away. And the example I can give you are those dominant teenage boys that I mentioned, you know, being the cool guys, right? In and of themselves, they're not legitimating gender inequality. But as soon as they bully, for instance, other boys and feminize those other boys in a subordinate way, they are constructing a momentary hegemonic masculinity there. You see that? It has to be that relationship. That's how masculinity acquires its legitimacy, right? That's how hegemonic masculinity acquires its legitimacy, is through that subordination of, in particular, anything feminine, right? Whether it's invested in boys, in male bodies, or in female bodies, right? That's how uh, hegemonic masculinity acquires its legitimacy. And, um, uh, and so it can be, uh, it can be very, uh, very quickly done, you know, discursively. Another example of that is uh, on American TV, uh, there was this uh, a general electric advertisement of uh, of uh, uh, what we would call, you know, uh, a young uh, young adult male who is sitting. Uh, um, he, he's kind of a nerdy, you know. 
He's supposed to be a, identified as a, a young adult male nerd who has just got a job with General Electric. And he's sitting in the living room with his, with his parents, who are clearly working class parents. And uh, uh, the father has this huge sledgehammer, right, on the coffee table. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the young uh, son uh, mentions how excited he is about getting this job. This is, a, you have to understand, this is an advertisement for General Electric. Uh, you know, he, he, uh, he's excited because he's going to work on computers, right? He's going to be a computer nerd, right? And uh, the father picks up the sledgehammer and says, this was your grandfather's and puts it down right in front of the young uh, son and says, you can't pick that up, can you? And the son can't pick it up. He's feminized in that momentary fleeting interaction there. And that's how omnipresent hegemonic masculinity can be, right? In that 30 second commercial, what we have represented in front of us is gender inequality be, being constructed between that father and son, right? Embedded, invested in those two male bodies. You have this male body, father, you know, who is this kind of masculine working class guy. And then you have this nerdy uh, uh, son who can't pick up this sledgehammer. You know, he's too feminine to do that, so. That's thank another you. example. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's yeah. basically what's available to you. And then if you have the right type of, of embodiment, then it's even easier to, to, to access, you know. As, yeah. And so that's, yeah. yeah, thank you. And so that's, uh, it probably wasn't shown that advertisement in, in Italy or Spain. Uh, so, it, so that would make it a regional hegemonic masculine. <laughs> Uh, one moment. Thank you, Jim, for your talk. I would like to see in the audience how many questions are there. Maybe we can take more, like 15, 20 minutes more, and then have also a small break, and then go on to the first panel. How many questions? I have one. Okay. Two. More questions? Just to have an idea. Well, we'll see. Who's the second? Begonia. Thank you. Well, many th oh. um, many thanks, Jim, for this beautiful and illustrating talk. I just have to. I I don't know how to express them. Two preoccupations, two worries, or maybe two questions. I don't know exactly what is the correct word. Oh, the first one refers to uh, your sentence where you say, female masculinity is disruptive, right? Um, Not always. I, no. uh, oh, oh, okay. And, well, well the, the, the worry I have on my mind is, okay, Female masculinity can be disruptive, but male femininity or effeminacy has never been considered socially as disruptive. Right. So here it seems to me that we have a big trouble with the categories mm -hmm. because we're just working with the same categories that are being used yeah. to stigmatize yeah. the categories. So that's my first worry. Yeah, let me respond to that. Um, can, can you hear me? Is this working? Okay. <clears throat> um, that example I gave of what I'm calling protective mas uh, hegemonic masculinity of the, uh, of the caring person over uh, the partner. Do you remember that uh, example? That was a lesbian relationship. Mm -hmm. And so you have a lesbian relationship, right? Where you have a shy partner and a very protective partner. And so that would be, that's an example of hegemonic masculinity actually being invested in a female body, right? 
So I don't want anyone to go away with the, the uh, impression that I'm saying that all female masculinities are disruptive because, you know, in that, in that situation, they were constructing in their relationship, which was an accepted relationship in the school. It was a, it was a young uh, uh, high school uh, couple. Uh, and this, uh, this um, um, is reported in my most recent book, uh, Masculinities in the Making, that just came out this year, uh, if you're interested in reading more. Um, and so uh, uh, that would be an example of that. But at the same time, um, masculinities constructed in female bodies have historically been disruptive to men. They become a challenge to men. For instance, whenever women enter into employment that has been kind of culturally seen as male employment, uh, for instance, women entering into a police force, women entering into the military, uh, which we see in the United States, by the way, with regards to the military, a dramatic rise in sexual violence. This is what I mean about the challenge, right? So it's what's taking place there is you have, and also, uh, I mean, there's studies that, that go back to Cynthia Coburn's study, studies of, uh, you know, working class jobs and women uh, working in those working class jobs and therefore engaging in the same kinds of uh, work activities as the men, therefore challenging their work masculinity, right? And so in each of these cases, that, that takes place and it becomes disruptive um, to that uh, particular setting. And, uh, but that doesn't mean it's always disruptive, right? And uh, the, <coughs> excuse me, the way that it's usually been handled is that women are eventually moved out of those situations, although that hasn't occurred most recently. <coughs> um, what, is, what has taken place is, um, uh, for instance, uh, women, you know, who move into, uh, you know, t uh, into the medical profession, they move into more feminized kinds of uh, uh, parts of the, the medical profession. Uh, the military doesn't let women be on the front lines, you know, so you still have that binary being produced, constructed, right? So. And just a, a second comment or a worry. I liked a lot the idea of breaking the uh, system sex gender body because that's precisely the field where I'm moving, you know. And I think you, you just proposed two very interesting things. One is empirical work, which I do because I'm an anthropologist and, you know, every I'm, sorry, I I'm an anthropologist, so every now and then we go to the field work and go on to empirical work. Oh, empirical work. Yeah. Empirical work. And uh, the, other, um, the, the other thing related to this, and which I thought was very interesting as well, was your final idea of momentary hegemonic masculinities. Why? Because, for example, one of the most curious things that I have found in the field when I studied the birth subculture, the bear, the bear gay subculture, which I did for the some time. Bear, bears, osos? Bears. Bears. Hairy, big men with... Bears. Oh, bear culture. Oh, the bear okay, culture. Okay, yeah, the, yeah. The, well, the, one the, of gay, the, the gay yeah, bear culture. Yeah. <laughs> I thought um, you were studying um, Maine black bears. And, and, you know, I'm sorry about... <laughs> I'm sorry about the pronunciation. That's of okay. Beer. That's okay. This is probably my. At least I didn't say beer, which at this time of the day <laughs> would be very inconvenient, you know. <laughs> well, when I when I studied them, one of the things that I found that was really surprising was the making of a special category, which was the muscle bear, which in definition was absolutely contradictory to the essence or philosophy of what a bird had to do. Right. So I think that this can, we can only pay attention to these movements or these changing hegemonies or spirals of hegemonies, and I, I normally say, 
through this concept that you just introduced of moments, you know, right. timeline hegemonies, and I think that's a very good idea. So if you can develop it a little bit more, yeah, well, I what happens you know, in, in, in our construction of gender is that we do it situationally, right? In other words, our gender construction changes by social situation. And, um, you know, one of the things that I've emphasized is uh, the relationship, you know, I, I agree with Judith Butler in the sense that we socially construct sex. I disagree with how we do that uh, with Judith Butler, but I agree with her that we do that. And, and we do that uh, by reason of, you know, for instance, we can look around this room and we can identify, for the most part, two and only two sexes, right? In other words, we have this kind of cultural discourse where there's only two and only two sexes and we, we construct those, uh, those sexes uh, through our gender display and our gender practices, right? Um, and, um, but we do that differently, right? I mean, uh, you know, sex tends to be tends to be a cross-situational construction. In other words, once we identify ourselves as male or female, we tend to stick with that, although not always, do we, right? Um, you know, with regard, especially with regards to the transgender movement, right? Uh, that has changed dramatically, but what it shows us is the social construction of sex. Uh, but gender, what we do is we, we change our gender, gender construction situationally. And, uh, um, uh, you know, what I'm saying is that it's even more, we have to be even more precise about that and look at it in terms of it being even fleeting and very momentary, like that advertisement or like those boys who become bullies. Um, and... Um, and I think that that's what makes it very, very, very difficult to create change. Um, you know, we've had, we've had a, a feminist movement, um, I don't know how long it's been in, in Italy and Spain, but it's uh, been for, uh, you know, uh, many years in the United States. You know, there's been what's called three waves of feminism in the United States, probably similar in Italy and Spain. Um, and there's been dramatic changes taking place, but that binary continues, that uh, creation of hegemonic masculinities continues, and, uh, um, you know, we uh, have the election of someone like, uh, you know, an incredible misogynist and racist Donald Trump, which forces us to, you know, take steps back, right? And wonder what we've been doing. <laughs> and uh, um, um, which was a complete surprise to, uh, to many of us. Um, but given the, you know, the conditions, um, uh, especially in the West, uh, how things are changing uh, to movements towards the right, it's not that surprising. But anyway, I got off on the momentary <laughs> onto Trump. <laughs> I don't, did that answer your? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you want No, no, no. Do we have time for a short question? Okay, I, I would like to move from the dimension of everyday social practices of masculinities in order to address the dimension of the production of knowledge coming production of, of knowledge. The production of knowledge coming from those kind of uh, of experiences. The I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Oh, knowledge, knowledge. knowledge. Uh, the production oh, okay. of no because w w what we see is that um, all this kind of positive experiences of masculinity they do produce a knowledge about the world, and more specifically, they do produce a knowledge about the gender dimension of the world. So I cannot avoid asking you the following questions. What do you think about the knowledge that those kind of uh, positive experiences of masculinity produce? What yeah, kind of uh, knowledge do we have? Right. Um, well, you know, in the, in, in the interviewing that I've uh, done of the, um, of the teenage boys and girls, uh, the major uh, aspect of that was on bullying. 
And, um, and so uh, I've been, uh, uh, because of that work, I've been invited to a number of uh, high schools in the U.S. to help them uh, put together anti-bullying programs. And uh, I think this may be what you're asking. How do, we, how do we bring out the knowledge about such positive masculinities into the open, right, as a form of social change? And um, uh, because, uh, you know, the boys that, that I found who were constructing positive masculinities, those boys that were in the laid-back groups, right, um, and, uh, you know, with the boys and girls, the, uh, um, uh, you know, the non-hierarchical, you know, kind of relationship, that tends to be hidden, doesn't it, in, in most schools, that tends to be hidden. So what I proposed, and actually a couple schools adopted, which surprised the hell out of me, uh, was that, um, you know, I mean, these high schools in the United States, they have all kinds of awards for intellectuals, which they should, right? But also awards, most of the awards are for uh, athletes, right? And so I proposed, how about a social justice award? And a couple schools adopted it. In other words, identifying, um, you know, boys and girls who are practicing social justice. And that helps to make, bring out those, uh, uh, those kinds of relations into, uh, into the public setting. Um, another example that I give uh, uh, as, as, as a means of change is, um, um, you know, a, a statement by uh, the school that is distributed to parents, te uh, teachers, kids, uh, the community, that there's zero tolerance for bullying, right? So bringing out because that's a, that becomes a form of hegemonic masculinity, right? And so by, by getting a school to create a, a school policy statement that actually says zero bullying will take place in this school and announces that to the community at large, uh, it's a form of knowledge production, right? It brings out an alternative uh, understanding of uh, masculinity, right? And another way is to uh, discuss it, uh, uh, you know, in the uh, in the classroom. For instance, in in my interviews, I found boys who, who uh, uh, you know, when they were bullied, uh, the the culture of the school said that that what they should do to be masculine is to fight back, physically fight back against the bully. And some parents actually encouraged them to do that. But some boys decided through their, through their parents to, uh, to just simply walk away from the bully, right? And so, uh, uh, you know, I proposed that and, and, and I proposed uh, having a discussion in uh, classrooms of uh, how different boys and girls have responded to bullying and some brought up that walking away, and it in, inevitably then leads to a discussion of, wow, you really have a lot of guts and a lot of courage, right? In other words, it reverses the masculinity. Now masculinity is positive. It's challenging that bully in a very positive, nonviolent way. So. Thank you very much, Jim. Any more questions? Juanjo, yes? Maybe a small question, yeah? And then we can go for a coffee break. And then, yes? Tenterò parlare in italiano. Il mio italiano è molto precario, ma... C'è un problema che mi concerne molto. E il problema dell'educazione sessuale degli adolescenti in questo momento credo che non sia una vera educazione sessuale l'educazione sessuale si è fatta mm, su, eh, innanzitutto sul piano della pornografia eh, la, la, la maniera più potente 
e, um, e questo ha um, conseguenze molto importanti sulle, eh, sulle relazioni tra i sessi. Allora, um, questa è una questione a livello internazionale, a livello regionale, a livello locale. E, cosa facciamo per, 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 per cambiare questo? Perché questa è una, un, una questione che si... Um, che, nascot, che si nasconde, no? si nasconde e non è più parlata fra noi, ma è molto importante. Una grande influenza è la pornografia mainstream, è una pornografia soprattutto violenta e soprattutto chi ha un rapporto fra i sessi così marcato, molto marcato, e allora ha, ehm, cioè, ha conseguenze sull'educazione sull delle, delle adolescenti nei suoi rapporti con le altre sessi. Yeah. Yeah, well that's, uh, uh, you're completely right. Um, um, you know, in uh, secondary schools, and I, I guess it's the same in Italy, in Spain, as in the United States, there is absolutely no, at the secondary level, you know, the high school, middle school level, um, discussion of uh, a, a, a critical analysis of sexuality. Uh, in the United States, there are sex ed, what's referred to as sex ed courses which is basically how, you know, the male and female bodies work. Put that in quotes, right? In other words, nothing about uh, uh, the meaning and dynamics of sexuality itself, right? And so what I've proposed to schools when I go there, when I'm invited, you know, uh, as this anti-bullying expert, right? uh, is because sexuality is so much a part of the bullying as well isn't it, uh, that there needs to be a serious curriculum change, uh, you know, where uh, a, a critical analysis of sexuality is brought into um, schools, because that does happen in some parts of the world, in, uh, in the Scandinavian countries, for instance, you know, where sexuality is not a bad term, right, uh, and they're more open to discussing sexuality in schools. And uh, uh, it, uh, it does happen. And, um, you know, uh, uh, I, one of the questions I ask uh, my uh, undergraduate uh, college uh, students when I teach undergraduate courses is, uh, how many of you took a class in high school or middle school that was a critical, serious, analysis of sexuality, not how the body works, right? But sexuality and no hands go up. But yet we do it in college, right? In universities. And so we can do it, like you say, um, in uh, secondary schools as well. It should be done. It should definitely be done, yeah. Uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you, everybody. I think we can uh, have an applause. Thank you.